Good evening and welcome to Mining the Riches of the Parsha. Tonight is Thursday night, April 11th, 2024. So tonight, of course, the 11th, we're meeting at 8 p.m. A week from tonight, we will uh, April 18th, we will also meet at 8 p.m. This week's Torah portion is the Torah Parsha of Tazria, but tonight I'm going to speak about Tazria and the next portion, Mitzora. In some years, they're read together. This year, they're read separately. But I'm going to speak about both of them tonight because next week, April 18th at 8 p.m., I plan to speak about Pesach, about Passover. Then we will take off a week during the middle of Pesach, which is April 25th. We will not be meeting together. But after Pesach is over, May 2nd, we will come back and we will resume at 7 p.m. and hopefully continue then consistently at 7 p.m. It's fascinating that this week's Torah portion and next week, Tazria and Mitzorah, two portions that on the surface seem the most bizarre, seem the least connected to our lives, the least relevant to us. In fact, according to the interpretation given by our sages, these two portions are one of the most relevant, the most applicable, especially for us right now. And I hope to share with you this evening several aspects of this important relevance to what's happening to us today. So the first piece I want to share comes from Rabbi Shmuel Kamenetsky. Now, we've discussed this before in previous years, this subject of these two Torah portions is tsara'as. Now, tsara'as is often translated as leprosy. It's not leprosy. It's a very bad and unfortunate translation. Tsara'as is actually a physical change in a person's skin, but is not medical. It comes from a spiritual defect. And it shows up in different ways, lots of different details about it, which we will see a little bit later tonight. But the first question is, this bizarre subject comes immediately after last week's Torah portion, the Parsh of Shmini, the end of which were the dietary laws, the laws of what is kosher and what is not kosher. So Rabbi Kamenetsky asks, what is the connection, the thematic connection, between the laws of keeping kosher in last week's Torah portion and the laws of tzara'as in this week's Torah portion? So here's an answer that I will share in the form of two stories. The first story I heard from Rabbi Pesach Krohn and it goes like this. It concerns the Chavetz Chaim, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Kagan, who lived in a small town in Europe called Radin. The Chavetz Chaim was the greatest Torah leader of his time in the early 20th century. And he was particularly careful about the sin of Lashon Hara, speaking negatively about another person. It happens that one time the Chavetz Chaim was traveling together with another respected rabbi and they stayed overnight at an inn owned by a Jewish woman. So the, the, the two rabbis had dinner and when they finished the dinner, the woman who owned the inn She was extremely impressed that these two famous sages had come to stay at her inn overnight. So she went over to them and she asked them how they liked the meal. So the other rabbi, 
who was traveling with the Chavetz Chaim, the other rabbi said the meal was delicious. However, the soup needed a little bit more salt. Okay. The Chavetz Chaim, after the woman went away, the Chavetz Chaim said to him, what did you just do? Did you think about what you just said? Think for a moment about the power of your words. The cook in the back is probably some poor woman who desperately needs her job. The innkeeper, the owner of the inn, is probably back in the kitchen right now yelling at her for creating a subpar meal for these distinguished guests, and she's probably going to fire her on the spot. Because of your words, you could have brought her and her entire family into poverty. Then the two rabbis got up, and they quietly walked to the door of the kitchen, and in fact, that's exactly what was happening. So the other rabbi immediately ran over to the owner of the inn and he said to her, listen, I I didn't mean to say what I said. The food was delicious. It was really very good. Please don't take anything out on this woman, this cook. She did a great job. Please don't do that. And the woman who was after all a kind person, she listened to the rabbi and she rehired the cook. But the lesson of the Chavetz Chaim is so important. What you may say may seem innocuous, but it could cause tremendous harm to somebody else. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, another great sage who was very careful about character development and refinement, he used to say, many Jews, many religious Jews, are very, very careful about what goes into their mouths to keep kosher, to insist the highest standards, to be careful, never to take a chance. But all too often, unfortunately, those same Jews who are so careful about what goes into their mouths are not consistent and they're not so careful about what comes out of their mouths, the words that they speak. And the parsha of Saras, which our rabbis tell us, is a spiritual, is a physical discoloration of the sin that comes from the spiritual sin of Lashon Hara, of speaking negatively about someone else. This is what our rabbis identify as the cause of this visible discoloration on a person's skin. This topic immediately follows last week's portion of Shmini. Last week, we talked about what we are allowed to put in our mouths and not put in our mouths. And this week, we talk about what we are allowed to leave our mouths and what we are not allowed to leave our mouths. That's the reason the two are together. Rabbi Shlomo Welba, a great scholar of the previous generation, once wrote, we put a lot of effort into teaching a baby to talk but we do not invest much thought into teaching ourselves when to be silent. And we should also remember the good that we're capable of when we do speak. We can cause tremendous harm and pain, even without meaning it, but we can also cause tremendous good. So here's a second story. It also involves the Chavez Chaim. I heard this story from Rabbi Moshe Weinberger, and it's about a, a great scholar and teacher, Rabbi Elia Lapian. Rabbi Elia Lapian lived in the middle of the previous century, well-known teacher, writer, Talmudic scholar, And he had a yeshiva, 
and he had to travel to raise funds for his yeshiva. And it once happened that he came to England, a certain town in England, to raise funds for his school. And the people, the Jewish people in this town told him, listen, there is in our town a gvir, a very, very wealthy man. And he's very generous. He gives a generous donation to every rabbi who comes asking for a donation. You should make sure to go visit him. Just one thing you should know, he supports every Torah institution, but he himself is not religious. He's not observant. He doesn't keep the laws of the Torah. Revelia said to them, you know what? I'm not interested in being supported by a person whose own lifestyle is not in accord with what he is trying to support. We teach to observe the laws of the Torah, and if a person is choosing not to do that, we would prefer not to be supported by such a person. But the people of the town pressed him, and they said, listen, okay, that's fine. You can have your principles, but if you don't go to see this man, Rebellion Lapian was a well-known rabbi. Everyone knew that he was in town. If you don't go to see this man... He's going to be insulted that you didn't come to ask him for a donation. And maybe he'll stop giving donations to everybody else. It's one thing for you to stick to your principles for yourself, but not if it might affect others. So Rebellia said, okay, I'll go to visit this man out of respect for the good that he does. But he decided to himself, I'm not going to ask him or accept any donation, but I'll go to speak to him. Rebellia goes to this man's house, a very, very wealthy man, and they sit down and they talk. And Rebellia says to this man, he says, please excuse me. Please don't be insulted, but I, I have a question I just don't understand. You're very generous to every rabbi that comes for a donation. You're very generous to support every Torah institution. But you yourself are not religious. You yourself do not observe the laws of the Torah that you support by the donations that you give. Could you just please explain to me why that is? It's just curious to me. Why? And the man said to him, I've never told this story to anyone. But since you asked, and I know that you're an important person, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the story that happened to me. The man said, when I was a boy, I was already off the path of Judaism. I rebelled against Judaism, rebelled against my family. And my parents said that I had to go. They were sending me to study in a yeshiva in Radin to learn Torah in the yeshiva of the Chavetz Chaim, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Kagan of Radin. Now, it doesn't sound like such a great idea for someone who's rebelling against Judaism. And the man says, as a boy, I did not want to go, but they made me, I had no choice. So I traveled a long time by train to Radin. Radin is a tiny, tiny village in Poland. Now, in order to be accepted into the yeshiva in Radin, the Chavetz Chaim's yeshiva, you had to meet one of the administrators and you had to take a test to see if you were suited to enter this yeshiva. The man says, when he met this administrator and he started asking him some questions about the Talmud, it was immediately obvious that I was not cut out for this yeshiva. And the administrator said to me, you're not accepted and you need to go home. And the man said, the truth is I was relieved because I didn't want to be there to begin with. I didn't belong there. So, okay, I did what my parents asked. I came, I tried, but I was rejected. So I went home. The problem was, by this time, it was nighttime. It was the middle of winter, it was freezing. And this was a small town. There were no trains out of town. There was no way to leave Radin that night. And he says, I didn't know anybody in this small town. 
and there was no train till the next day, and it's freezing. I just didn't know where I was going to be overnight. I had nowhere to sleep, nowhere to get warm. So the man says, again, he's telling this story when he was a boy. I knew that in Rabin was the Chavetz Chaim. The Chavetz Chaim was the most famous Torah leader in all of Europe. And he was known for his kindness, his generosity. Of course, he himself was very, very poor. But his kindness, his empathy, along with his scholarship. So the boy says to himself, maybe I'll go to see the, to the house of the Chavetz Chaim and he'll at least advise me what I should do. So he says, I went to his house, not so hard to find in this tiny little village. I knocked on the door. And the Chavetz Chaim himself answered the door. So he says, Rebbe, I came to join the yeshiva here, but I was not accepted. Can I at least stay in the dormitory overnight? I have nowhere else to be. It's freezing outside. There's no train that leaves here now. Can I at least sleep in the dormitory tonight and I'll leave first thing in the morning? And the Chavetz Chaim said, no. No. If you're not accepted to the yeshiva to stay for the year, then you may not spend the night in the dormitory. No. So, now this man, this boy is thinking to himself, hold on, this is the Chavetz Chaim? I mean, this is the famous person everybody's talking about, the greatest Torah leader of the generation. That's how he talks to someone, a stranger, a little boy who has nowhere to be overnight and it's freezing outside. So the boy said to him, Rebbe, what am I going to do? It's freezing outside. I don't know anyone here. I can't leave till tomorrow. What should I do? Chavetz Chaim said, I think you misunderstood me. I, no, you may not spend the night in the dormitory. However, with your permission, I would love to have you as my guest here in my home. You'll stay with me tonight. <sighs> so the boy's thinking to himself, this is a strange day. I get rejected from the yeshiva, and I'm a guest at the home of the Chavis Chaim. All right. He comes in, the Chavetz Chaim goes, gives him dinner, and then the boy goes to sleep. He goes to sleep. But the boy can't sleep. He's thinking about all that has happened to him, and as he's lying there in bed, the Chavetz Chaim, who thinks he is sleeping, opens the door, And now the boy closes his eyes and pretends to be sleeping because the Chavetz Chaim thought he was sleeping. The Chavetz Chaim walks into his room. He leans over the boy and the Chavetz Chaim whispers to himself, Nebuch, I think my guest is cold. And the Chavetz Chaim takes off his own jacket And he puts his jacket on top of the boy. Now, all these years later, this man says to Ravel Yalapian, he says, Rabbi, I want you to know, it's because of that whisper of the Chafetz Chaim that I have any warm feelings towards Judaism and those who observe it. Though I do not observe the commandments myself, I support every yeshiva, every Torah institution because of those whispered words of the Chavetz Chaim. That's what we can and should strive to accomplish with what comes out of our mouths. Okay, so the topic of this week's Torah portion, as you read and hear and learn the Torah portion this week, you're going to roll your eyes. It's just 
There are spots that appear on the skin. The Torah says it's this color or that color. Hairs that turn white. It, it's, it's just bizarre. It's weird. It's just, it's just very strange. And as I said before, our sages explain, it is not a physical disease that would call for a doctor. It is not leprosy, although that's how it is often translated. That's a mistake. It is a physical manifestation of a spiritual disease of a person who spoke Lashon Hara, spoke negatively about another person. And that spiritual deficiency caused a change in the appearance on the skin, on a person's clothing, and even on the walls of a person's house. That's the subject matter of this week's Torah portion, Tazria, and next week's Torah portion, Mitzorah. It's kind of like, if you think about the story of Pinocchio, right? Pinocchio, whenever he would tell a lie, it would show up visibly so that he and others could see that he had just told a lie. Okay, it sounds really weird. I understand that. But please listen carefully to an observation made by the Rambam Maimonides. The Rambam says this whole subject, as strange and weird as it sounds, this whole subject was a divine kindness. It was a method of God giving an individual constructive criticism. It's God giving us a loving message. Be careful how you speak. You may not even have realized it, but your words cause pain to someone. Your words separated one person from another. You need to be more careful so you don't cause pain again. So you don't cause harm again with your words. And the Ramam goes further to say, we are impoverished not to have tzara'as today. Of course, it doesn't exist. It has not existed since the time that the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, stood in Jerusalem. Can you imagine what the world would be like if a person had committed a sin and there would be some kind of feedback? You made a mistake. You need to correct it. You need to improve. And that we were convinced that that constructive criticism was coming from one who loves us one who is not jealous of us, one who only wants what is best from us, one who is God. Can you imagine what the world would be like, what each of us would be like if we had that kind of feedback? So we are impoverished not to have this, as strange as it sounds. But there is a verse in this week's Torah portion with a curious extra word. So, as I said, it's a physical manifestation of a spiritual disease. That's why we don't call a doctor. The Torah elsewhere tells us if we have a physical condition, we have to consult the doctor and follow the doctor's advice, the medical advice. But this is not a medical cause. It's a spiritual cause. So we don't call a doctor. We call a Kohen, one of the priests whose job it is to ensure sanctity and holiness. And this person has caused within themselves a lowering of holiness. And so we need the Kohen to help the person fix it. And the Torah says, V'huva el Aharon ha-Kohen. A person with this condition, or apparently with this condition, is brought before Aharon the Kohen. Aharon, of course, the brother of Moshe, was the first Kohen. But the question is, why does it mention Aharon specifically? I mean, this is a rule where a person would go to any Kohen, and throughout the centuries, this was applicable. Of course, Aharon was no longer alive in all those centuries. During the time that the temple was standing, a person would go to any Kohen. Why does it say the person should be brought to Aharon, the Kohen? 
So I want to share with you an answer that is very relevant in our lives. It's presented by Dr. Abraham Torsky. And the answer goes like this. There's a misconception about Lashon Hara. Many people have heard Lashon Hara, don't speak negatively about somebody else. If you say to someone, oh, you shouldn't say that that's Lashon Hara, very often what you will hear back is, no, it's not. It's true. What I said was true. It's not Lashon Hara. And that's a very important misconception that we need to correct because there are, in fact, two aspects of prohibited speech. One is libel, to say something negative about another person that is not true. That's actually a separate prohibition called motzi shemra, to say libel about another person, a terrible sin. And then there's gossip, to say something negative about another person when it is true. That is precisely when it is Lashon Hara. Now, sometimes there is a need to say something negative about someone, for example, to prevent harm to a third party, or if you're testifying in court. There are other positive purposes where it's necessary to say what is actually true, even though it's negative. But to simply say something negative about another person that is true without some overriding constructive purpose that is Lashon Hara, prohibited. In other words, truth by itself is not always the highest value. Listen, please, to the words of the Chinuch, Sefer HaChinuch, Rabbi Aaron of Barcelona, who wrote explaining this mitzvah, Hashem chafetz betovas abrios asher bara. God wants for happy lives good lives among all of the creatures that he created. V'tzivanu b'zeh, God commanded us in this prohibition not to speak Lashon Hara, k'day lio shalom b'neinu, in order for there to be peace between us. Ki harachilus, because when someone speaks negative about someone else, siba l'riv umatzah, it is often a cause of argument and disharmony and machlokas. Just because something is true is not always a reason to say it. The irony is that Aharon is specifically known to us in connection with a lack of truthfulness. The Mishnah tells us the following famous line Aharon, Oevis Abrios, Aharon loved everybody. And the Talmud explains, what does that mean? In what way did that show itself, that Aharon had this deep love for every single person? So the Talmud tells a a type of a story, and this kind of a story happened over and over with variations. But the story goes like this. The paradigmatic, the model of Aharon's behavior is encapsulated in this story. Aharon sees that there are two people and they're having an argument. They're having a fight and they become enemies. So Aharon goes over to one of them and says, you know, the other fellow that I know that you're having the argument with, that fellow came to me and he said to me, he really feels bad about what he said to you, about what he did to you, and he really wants to apologize to you and to make up It's just that he has this pride that holds him back from coming over to you and saying those words. But you should know he really feels bad and he really wants to make up with you. It never happened. A guy never said anything like that. But this is the story that Aaron would tell one of them. And then Aaron would go to the other one and say the exact same story in reverse. You know that guy you're fighting with? He came over to me and he said how much he regrets it and he wants to apologize. He's just a little bit stubborn. He has a big ego. Never happened, but Aharon makes up this story. And then it would happen that these two people will just happen to be passing each other on the road coincidentally and they would fall into each other's arms and embrace because they each thought that the other wanted to apologize. And so Aharon in this way helped to bring about a resolution of the argument, and to restore peace. 
But how could Aaron do such a thing and how could our sages praise it? It's not true. He lied to both of them. He made up a story to both of them. So our sages answer in the Talmud that this is an example of Mishana Mibnei HaShalom. Under certain circumstances, when there will be no harm or loss, a person is allowed to say something that is not exactly true in order to bring about peace. Some people might refer to that with the phrase, a white lie. Now, it depends, of course. You know, it doesn't apply when there's a need for truth. For example, if you have a meal and your host says to you, you know, like the the innkeeper, the host says to you, did you enjoy the meal? So you're allowed to say, yes, I enjoyed it very much even if it could have used a little bit more salt. But if you're writing a review of a restaurant and you're being paid to tell the truth, you have to say what the truth is. You can't lie. People are relying on your recommendation. So it depends on the context. It depends on the situation. But that's why a person that had Saras had to confront Aharon specifically. And if not in person, at least that person with Saras must confront Aharon's legacy. Aharon understood that what is most important about words is not how truthful they are, but how much peace they engender. Earlier, I shared with you the opinion of the Rambam, the insight of the Rambam, Maimonides, that Taras is a form of divine feedback, constructive criticism. And in this week's Torah portion, we have the, the, the details of Taras that occurs on a person's skin. Then we have Saras that occurs on a person's garment. And in next week's Torah portion, Mitzorah, we have details concerning when Saras appears on the wall of a person's house. Now, if there is a discoloration on the wall and the Kohen sees, comes and sees that it is Saras, then it's a very serious consequence. It is necessary to dismantle the house brick by brick, stone by stone. It's a terrible hardship. Sounds like, you know, maybe a person has mold, you know, and it's a very difficult thing to uh, get rid of. But again, it is tsaras. It's a physical manifestation of this spiritual malaise. And our sages tell us that the order that the Torah teaches us these three subjects is actually in reverse order. There is a process where first a person would see Tsaras on their home. Then the next stage is they would see Tsaras on a garment. And the third stage would be if they see Tsaras on their own skin. And the reason that the Torah teaches it to us out of order is for us to know how bad it will get. The Torah starts with the worst form of it and then goes forward to less severe and least severe. Okay, that's the reason for the order. So the idea, of course, is the first thing that would happen is a person who spoke Lashon Hara would find Saras on their home. Hopefully they get the message. If they get the message, nothing else happens. But if they don't get the message and they don't improve their behavior, the second step is that there will be Saras on their garment. Now it's touching the skin. It's not on the skin, but it's touching the skin. It's closer. It's closer. Person pays attention, improves their behavior, that's it, it stops there. But if a person continues, then they get to the third level, which is the most serious level, where it's on your body, your skin itself. Okay. Why does a person 
What does a person have to do in order for tzaras, this discoloration, to appear on the wall of their house? Very strange, strange thing. So the Talmud says, Misakta Erechen, what I've told you several times, it comes because of the sin of Lashon Hara. It is a punishment. It is constructive criticism, feedback that you did something wrong. But the problem with that is there's another source that's quoted by Rashi. Rashi says, for Nasati Negatsaras, the Torah says, God says, I will place. Tsaras on the wall of your home, says Rashi, says Rashi, Basurahi Lahem. This is good news. This is good. Shahanagayim Bayan Alehem. If this Tsaras appears on the wall of your house, it's good. It's good news. Levishim Tinu Amaraim Mat Nonio Shalzahav Bikiras Batehem. Before the Jewish people came into the land of Israel, there were other people living there. Once the Jewish people came, and they came to live in the houses that had previously been inhabited by the pagans who had left, those pagans who lived earlier had taken their treasures and hid them inside the walls of their homes, behind the stones, in between the stones of the homes. Valyadea nega. And because a discoloration appears, and now I'm required to dismantle the whole home, to take apart every brick and every stone, no a bias. A person has to break apart their whole house. Um, and they find the treasure. <laughs> so, so what is it? Is it because of a sin? Or is it a treasure? It sounds so strange. How could there be two, t- two different possibilities as to why this happens? One which is such a terrible thing and which is such a wonderful thing. How could it be? So the Rambam explains it's a progression. A person speaks Lashon Hara. God sends that person a message a discoloration on the wall of their home. If a person listens to the message and improves, nothing further happens, and in fact, they find a treasure. But if a person does not listen, then the next stage is the tzaras appears on their garment. And if they still do not listen, the tzaras appears on their skin. If you respond to the constructive criticism and improve yourself, you will find treasure. And if you ignore it, it becomes a tragedy. Recognizing a mistake that we have made, being honest with ourselves, and using it to improve ourselves, that leads to treasure. And that's true on a physical level. It's true on a psychological and a spiritual level. Being willing to address issues and to learn from them leads to treasure. There was a well-known story about Thomas Watson, who was the legendary head of IBM many years ago. It happened once that a senior manager made a serious business mistake. It cost the the company $10 million, a $10 million loss because of this mistake. Watson summoned the manager into his office. The manager came in and said, I assume you want my resignation. And Watson said, are you crazy? We've just spent $10 million educating you. With that attitude, our mistakes lead to treasure. Allow me to share one more piece.
So we find ourselves in the middle of the third book of the Torah, the book of Vayikra. Vayikra also has another name. It's Torah's Kahanim, which means laws of the priests. The, the Latinized version of that is Leviticus, the laws of the Levites, the laws of the priests. And the entire book, we're in the middle of it. Our Torah portion of Tazria, we're in the middle of this book. The entire book, the entire third book of the Torah, Vayikra, is one long answer to the question, what is holiness? What is Kedusha? What does it mean to be holy? Now, later, in a few weeks, we will learn the Torah portion of Kedoshim, and we will learn perhaps the most general, comprehensive, fundamental mitzvah of the entire Torah, where the Torah says, Kedoshim to you, be holy. But what does it mean? How do we achieve that? So I want to suggest to you that the entire book of Vayikra is an expanded answer to that question because it has several necessary components, each of which is different from the other and essential and without any of which holiness cannot be attained. And our answer What is holiness? What does it mean to be holy? Our answer is unique and different from the answer given by other faiths. Holiness starts at the beginning of the book of Ayikra with the parsha of Ayikra and Tzav. Karbano, sacrifices. Sacrifices that were offered in the sanctuary, later in the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, offered by the Kohanim, the priests. These actions were mysterious, They were encounters with God through formal rituals of sacrificing and offerings, mostly done out of view of the rest of the people in the inner sanctum, the holy place, the sanctuary of the Beit HaMikdash, which was holy, or even in the Kodesh HaKadosh, in the Holy of Holies. That's one element to the definition of what is holiness, what is Kedusha. Then, in last week's Torah portion, the parish of Shmini introduced another element. And we discussed this last week, where the Kohanim, the priests, bless the people. That is also an essential aspect of holiness, to be concerned for the well-being of others, to bless others, as we discussed last week, without which no sacrifice can be accepted by God, as we explained last week. But notice, still, holiness is something done by a Kohen, a priest, in the Beit HaMikdash. It's in the sanctuary, in the temple. Then comes our Torah portion, and next week's Torah portion, Tazria and then Metzorah, where we have a completely new and surprising element to add to our definition of what is holiness. As I explained before, tsaras is a physical manifestation, but it is not from a medical cause, so it doesn't call for a doctor. It is a spiritual malaise. It is a lack of holiness, a lessening of a person's holiness. That requires a Kohen. The Kohen is in charge of holiness, so the Kohen is going to come and help this person reclaim and rejuvenate their holiness. The Torah says, the verse we quoted before, V'huva el Aharon Kohen, a person is brought before Aharon or any Kohen with these symptoms, and the Kohen will determine if this is Tzaras. So again, it's not a doctor who's making a determination because it's not a medical cause. It's a spiritual cause, so therefore the Kohen has to determine is it or is it not Tsaras, and if the Kohen says yes, it is Tsaras, then the Torah says, 
Badad yeshev michutz lamachane, a person has to go outside of the camp and stay by themselves for a certain amount of time to meditate on what they did, to try to um, integrate the need to improve themselves. They have to be by themselves outside the camp for a certain amount of time. Then listen carefully. The Torah says, The Kohen goes outside of the camp to where this person is sitting alone by themselves. And the Kohen looks at the person. And behold, he will find, hopefully he will find, that the person has been healed from this tsaras. And the Kohen will then bring the person back into the camp. So now we have something new that we've never seen before as our part of our definition of holiness. Because here, the Kohen does not stay inside the sanctuary. The Kohen goes outside of the sanctuary, outside of the camp, goes to the person who is away, outside, far away, to see if the person is okay. It doesn't happen in the sanctuary where the sacrifices are offered. It doesn't happen in the camp where all the people are. It happens outside the camp. The Kohen travels out in order to discover that this person has spiritually healed and then he can bring him back. And remember what we said before, the person comes with the personality of Aharon. Remember what we said, Rodev Shalom, the person, Aharon was a person who pursued peace. So this Kohen is coming to this poor person outside who's suffering to reestablish the bonds of community. Come back. Now you're okay. You, we want you to be included and welcomed and enveloped within the community. Up until now, we've been talking about what the Kohen does for the other person. But let's think for a moment, what does the Kohen receive through this experience? My friend and my teacher, Abe Mesrich, explains the person who's been sent away, who has been living outside of the camp, who has been living outside of holiness, that person now shows the Kohen that there are many places to find God. That God does not only approach a person in the sanctuary, in the Mishkan, in the temple, but even outside the sanctuary, even outside the camp alone, God can come to a person and help that person lift themselves up and reestablish their own holiness. To be holy, a Kohen cannot stay inside the sanctuary. A Kohen must go to where people are hurting, to where people are alone, to where people have stumbled, to where people have faced challenges and bring them back. And this is now another necessary component of holiness, to be where people are hurting, to be with people who are hurting. And this will lead us to the next and final step, which we will read in the Torah in just a few weeks. Where we will read in the Torah the famous line, the Ahavta Lareacha Kamocha, you shall love your fellow as you love yourself. People ask, why is this verse, this famous verse, Rabbi Akiva famously says that this is the most fundamental principle of the entire Torah. What is this verse doing in of all places in the book of Vayikra? Torah's Kahanim, laws of the priests. This is the most human, general principle of morality. What's it got to do with holiness? And the answer to that is that it is the necessary next step 
and last step of our definition of holiness. Because after Vayikra and Sav, and after Shmini, and after Tazriya Mitzorah, now it's not just the Kohen showing concern for others. It's not just the Kohen going to them. Now it applies to everybody. Every one of us has the obligation to care about another, not just to care about another, not just to help another person, but to love another person. And that becomes the final one of these elements. Each one of these elements is necessary, is a necessary component of our definition of holiness altogether, without any of which all the others are insufficient. Together, these elements create what Rabbi Jonathan Sachs refers to as the democratization of holiness, a comprehensive picture of Kedusha, sanctity, holiness, which is our life's mission to accomplish. Kedoshim Tihu, be holy with all of its components. The entire book of Vayikra gives us the lessons of how to achieve that. My friends, I wish you a great evening and a beautiful Shabbos, and I look forward to seeing you soon in person.